Thank you very much, Suzanne. And uh, yes, in Chicago, it's beautiful. I mean, the sun is shining. I'm pointing that way as if you could see the sun shining. You really can. Uh, and But maybe, I don't know, if you have really good eyes and you can see all the way to Chicago, no matter where you are joining in from, uh, it's 43 degrees here. I mean, wow, that's like summer in Chicago at this time of year. Uh, I, I was at a cat show. Uh, yeah, I know this talk is about dogs with separation anxiety. It was at the Lincoln State Cat Show, a uh, nationally renowned cat show speaking about other topics. I was not talking about dogs uh, this past weekend. And uh, the organizer, who's a legend in the cat world, Dale Marsh, came up to me and talked to me about her dog that has the, a crazy situation. Separation anxiety is a great part of it. So I told her about this talk. I'd like to welcome Dale especially, but all of you who are joining this talk. Uh, and this really is important because it can mean life or death for so many dogs. Now, anecdotally, what we're seeing is more and more separation anxiety. Uh, why? Well in part because of the huge changes that took place during the pandemic. I mean, suddenly everyone's home, now suddenly everyone, well, maybe not everyone, a lot of people go back to the workplace and change can be difficult for dogs. And that's one reason, that's the bullet point number three here, just as that change can be difficult for cats, uh, for people for sure, as well. Just because there's a change can prompt the behavior we haven't seen before. Also, and I'll talk more about this. There's a notion that dogs that were adopted, whether adopted during the pandemic or before, uh, from a shelter or rescue are more likely to have separation distress. Are they more predisposed? We don't know for sure. Uh, and as I say, I'll talk about that. But the bottom line is dogs that have been relinquished several times are more likely to have this problem. Uh, dogs that previously suffered separation anxiety, even if the problem was fixed, then during the pandemic, huge change. We're all home, dog is loving it. And now kids and adults are poof, just like that gone. If that's the case, that's the third bucket here, as I did these in reverse order, as, as the dogs that are most likely to have separation anxiety occur or reoccur having to do with the pandemic. But separation anxiety has been increasing for a long time, even before there was this word we call pandemic. Well, not before the word existed, but before the pandemic existed. Uh, so is it separation anxiety in the first place? And this is a hugely important slide. Is the dog just simply bored? I mean, just bored. Uh, is the dog truly under exercise? Now, exercise is a great thing for all dogs, all people, even for cats. I'm gonna try to work in cats for you, Dale, as often as I can. But I mean, truly, and by the way, cats can have separation anxiety as well. And a lot of what I say in this talk would apply to cats. Some of what I say would not really apply to cats. But is the dog truly under exercise? Well, that in of itself, okay, so a dog has separation anxiety, you ramp up the exercise, the dog is exhausted. I mean, you've run around the block 500,000 times with a French bulldog. Well, what you've got now is a tired dog with separation anxiety. If the dog truly has separation anxiety, yes, exercise is part of the fix, but in of itself, it's not going to fix the problem. Having said that, a dog can act out, if you will, there's a better way of saying that, express all that energy when you're not home, not because you're not home, but because the dog has all this excess energy and that is a dog that's just truly under-exercised and under-enriched, by the way. The environment has no enrichment. Uh, is this dog simply one who is never taught to be home alone, possibly? Is it a dog that truly is not house-trained that you think might be, but really isn't? And that's why there's accidents in the house. Uh, it's barking that often says, because a neighbor says, okay, your dog's barking all the time when you're not there. Uh, well, does this dog truly have separation anxiety because the dog is barking? Maybe, but maybe not. I mean, that dog might be barking, territorial barking, or reinforcement because it is simply fun to bark, or reinforcement because I did my job. So I bark at the UPS guy who delivers the package and goes away. I did my job because the UPS guy went away. That's the dog's perspective. Or the problem might be separation anxiety indeed, but as a result of canine 
cognitive dysfunction syndrome, which is kind of like doggy Alzheimer's. A lot of what I say here for that last bullet point will apply, but other things need to be done to help that dog with cognitive dysfunction. So what is separation anxiety in actuality? Well, it's separation from a specific person or isolation distress is more often the case. So uh, I'll use my own dog as an example, our household, Hazel. That's our dog's name. So Hazel has some touch of separation anxiety. That touch grows when my wife is out of town because she is so attached to my wife. So it's isolation distress, but for some dogs, some of the time, it's really separation from an individual person. No matter, separation anxiety usually is what I define and veterinary behaviorists who I respect greatly define as a panic attack. What are the signs of separation anxiety? How do you know it is? I told you when, what it might not be, but what is it? Well, here are a lot of the signs. Now, if the dog is just destroying the furniture and doesn't show anything else here, it tells me the dog was maybe never taught to be home alone, or something else is going on, but probably isn't separation anxiety. But if the dog is destroying the furniture, pacing and panting, that tells me it probably is separation anxiety. But there's more we can do to determine whether it is separation anxiety or not. And I'll talk about that right now. Cameras, so we can see what's happening. So you could see the dog or a professional can view the dog and see and hear, by the way, if the dog is distressed. So I'm gonna fast forward a bunch of this, this is a longer video. So you could hear that the dog is distressed, but it goes beyond that. You can see by the pacing and the signaling of the dog that this dog is distressed. You see all that, all that salivation and hair flying. Boom, dog is hyper salivating and excess shedding is going on, which is a sign of stress. Soon we're gonna see a dog with broken teeth that actually is able to break out of the crate because crate training is not the solution for many dogs with separation anxiety. It actually makes matters worse. A confining of my understand you need to do that because you don't want the living room destroyed, for example. But doing this isn't the answer. Confining the dog in, say, a kitchen or some other room the dog cannot do a lot of damage in by using baby gates and such is a good solution for some. But most dogs want to be at the door that you left from. And that's, by the way, where you set up the cameras, pointing at that door. Who has separation anxiety? Well, there have been several studies that have been done indicating that it is specific to certain breeds. There's one study in the breeds. Other studies indicate some different breeds. So I don't really know. Nobody does. Most dogs, when they exhibit this anxiety, are about between the age of a year and five. And almost all show more than one sign of anxiety. And that is, uh, that's important to understand. These dogs are generally anxious often and very often have other types of anxiety, which we'll see in a moment. 24, 20 to 40% of all behavior problems. Now, I'd argue these numbers are probably even higher. Are separation anxiety related? Um, adoptions, well, some have said shelter dogs are more likely to have separation anxiety. Others say, well, maybe they were given up in the first place because they had separation anxiety and you're adopting a dog that has it. What we do know is that dogs relinquished and have been rehomed many times are more likely to have it. Uh, neutering and, or spaying and living in a home with a single adult are risk factors. Uh, well, that figures. I mean, almost all dogs, most dogs, are spay neutered now, so that's good. Interesting, though, living with a single person, that dog, because these dogs are hyper-attached very, very often. And with behavior modification, we could do some things there to help. Dogs with one anxiety issue are more likely to have others. And here are the others they are more likely to have. Uh, so loud noises, strangers, fireworks, thunderstorm anxiety, 
general anxiety and travel anxiety. You see the percents there according to one study, but I will tell you there have been multiple studies that confirm this. The numbers are just slightly different from study to study, but essentially say the same thing, that a dog with separation anxiety is more likely to have, say, thunderstorm anxiety. Similarly, of course, dogs with thunderstorm anxiety more likely to have separation anxiety. Some of the fixes work with, for both. Uh, so why is this all important? Well, it's quality of life for that dog, for starters, and the people that live in the home. Panic attack? I mean, you know your dog is having that. You may not call it that, but that's awful. And um, who would want to live that way? And, and we are so affected that I know maybe some of you don't want to leave your house because your dog has separation anxiety. You don't even, so it affects you as well. Moreover, for especially people that live in condos and apartments, that dog, the landlord or condo association may say, uh, either you've got two days, two minutes to fix the problem or the dog is gone. So the dog is relinquished. Sometimes the dogs are re relinquished just because it is so hard to live with a dog or it can be so hard to live with a dog with separation anxiety. So I'm going to offer the cure, a cure you've not seen before and will never see again or your money back. Here's an interesting cure. Okay, maybe not. I said I do cats a lot, right? So there's a cat. Uh, here are some myths, what never to do. Pet parents saying, it's my fault because I kissed the dog too much or the dog shares the bed with me. That's silly. Um, it's just not true. Uh, separation anxiety isn't treatable. Well, it is, and I'm about to tell you how. Uh, medications are only the last resort. I argue in many cases, if not most, should be the first resort, uh, along with something called the calmer canine, which I'll believe me, talk about. Dog is being spiteful. No, 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 no. Dogs aren't spiteful, period. Uh, only uh, rescue or adopt the dogs. I've addressed that. The dog isn't trained well enough. Well, it has nothing to do with training. This has nothing to do with intelligence. Uh, you can sue the dog with separation anxiety. You, let me say that again. The misconception is you can't sue the dog with separation anxiety it will reinforce the anxiety. Well, by the very nature of it being separation anxiety, it's likely that no one is there. However, sometimes dogs uh, do express this anxiety separated rarely from another dog, more often from an individual person. And going up to that dog and saying, it's okay, it's okay, may not help, but it doesn't make matters worse. It might help just a little bit, uh, makes you feel better. There's no downside to it. Uh, dogs with separation anxiety must be crated. Well, we've already seen one example. That, no, that's not true. What doesn't work? Getting another pet. People think, okay, if I get two dogs, that dog that's anxious isn't going to be anxious anymore. No. Uh, I wish that were true. And sometimes it is, actually, but mostly not. Sometimes getting a cat. I mentioned cat again. Getting a cat can solve the problem for a dog with separation anxiety or vice versa. That's rare. That is rare. It's from humans that this dog has the issue in overwhelmingly, I don't know the percent, I'll make it up 95%, I made that up. But in the overwhelming number of cases, no study has been done to tell us the percent. Uh, being the pack leader, I am in charge so the dog doesn't have separate. There was a TV dog trainer that used to say that. Separation anxiety has nothing to do with you being dominant over your dog, which is a silly notion anyway, and has nothing to do with you being a pack leader, whatever the hell that means, uh, doing nothing. So many say, oh, I, I'll go to work. And yes, I know my dog was anxious when I wasn't there. The camera tells me, or I just know, well, fine, that's Monday. Tuesday, it'll get better because the dog will figure out I'm, I came home Monday. Or over time, the dog will figure this out and that's not how it works. I wish it did. Punishment. No, it's called separation anxiety. These dogs are anxious. So punishing a dog for something the dog doesn't understand why you're angry, doesn't even understand the notion that I'm being punished and certainly not for what, that just makes the dog more anxious as it would you. So if I come home and just scream at you in a foreign language, you know I'm mad, but you don't know what for, does that, how does that make you feel? 
the next time I come home, even more anxious. And we're about to see an example of that. So these people came home. They're not yelling and they're, they're not, let me see if I can start the video. They're not yelling. Back from lunch they're not morning. screaming at the store. <laughs> so what's going on? This dog, and you can see by the signaling, this dog is actually afraid. Now, maybe previously they punished the dog. I don't know. Maybe previously they yelled at the dog, which is also punishment in some way. I don't know. Maybe this dog, as dogs can do, is just picking up on other body language and or our pheromones or something else that we don't quite understand. And this dog has says, I have reason to be fearful. I need to protect myself. That's what's going on here. This dog didn't do something because of spite and does not now feel guilty as a result. Dogs don't do that. Tools to help separation anxiety or help identify what's going on because it's separation anxiety, you're not there in almost every case. So how do you know what's going on? Well, there's a quiz. It's like a, a good housekeeping. Remember those magazines and they had those self quizzes? So this isn't the, a, an official veterinary quiz, but the great thing about this quiz for clients or pet parents is it can tell you, if you're a pet parent, the likelihood that something else is going on and all, life separation anxiety and help you think about it a little bit. Uh, but most importantly, these days, camera. And, and the great news is when I give this talk or a talk similar to this, say five years ago, and I mentioned cameras, they were just a little bit of a mention because cameras were kind of expensive and not everyone could do it. And I understood that. Today, the cameras are not only not expensive, we're talking like 20 bucks, they're readily available. Amazon for starters, but a lot of other places as well. If you get one camera and only one camera, it's less expensive, I suppose, and you just point it at the door that you departed from. Ideally, two or three cameras, that, unless you live in a studio, uh, because that way you can see what else is going on with that dog. But most dogs with separation anxiety will spend at least most of their time somewhere near the door that the person left from. Now, it might be in another room where I get a view of that door. And that's why I say more than one camera can be helpful. So be proactive for starters. Also, assuming your dog is treat motivated, leave some amazing treats inside some toys, leave the house for just minutes or less and see if the dog has scarfed up some of those treats. If not, that also tells you something else is going on. And you can have a camera watch it all. And if you're not a veterinary professional and you're watching this, I, I'm a huge proponent of you showing a veterinary professional what's going on because that person is trained to see it and because that person is Switzerland. When it's your own dog or cat, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, it's hard to know because you're putting your own judgments in it in this animal you love so much. The veterinarian may love or technician or nurse may love your pet, but not the same way you do, of course, and can look at it in a more, uh, what's the right word that I'm looking for? Um, <laughs> neutral way? That's not quite the right word, but you know what I mean, I think. This dude, ask him to do your income tax right now. It's that season. I think he's otherwise occupied and too panicked to do something like that. I said earlier, these dogs are having panic attacks and they are. We need to teach dogs how to be home alone, but we can't do that if they're panicked because dogs or cats or people cannot learn at the moment they're panicked. It's impossible pretty much. So what do we do to help them learn? Well, behavior modification is what we eventually want to go to. And I switched up some slides. So you know what I want to do? I want to do this. Um, I want to start here because I, I now think, okay, I should have switched them up in a different way. You don't need to worry about it. Psychopharmaceuticals. That's the heavy hit and or one of the two. And I'll tell you about the other in a moment. And then I'll go back to behavior modification. Why are we starting with psychopharmaceuticals or the calmer canine or both? There's a couple of reasons for that. Now, some people define or want you to define separation anxiety as extreme, severe, they have different terms for it. 
It's in the red zone and the green zone. Everyone defines it differently and there is no specific definition. So if a dog is, let's say, pacing back and forth, and you know this by the cameras telling you, the dog is pacing back and forth, hypersalivating a bit and barking just a little bit at the door. That's one dog. The second dog is doing all those things, barking more than a little bit, however, barking also at the window, is also having accidents every time the person leaves the house and only when the person leaves the house, so you know the dog is house trained. Uh, and you come home finding salivation all over the place. Now, the second dog would be described as more severe in the red zone or whatever. But does that mean that one dog is actually feeling more than the other distress or panic more? I don't know that we know that. The dogs can't really tell us. So you can be panicked, for example, and express that panic in one way, and your significant other can be just as panicked and maybe more panicked, and express it in a way that isn't quite as observable to another person. Emotions may vary, but we don't all express those emotions similarly. And dogs are the same as far as we know. So is one dog actually suffering more severe distress or are we just seeing more severe signs? And the emotion is the same as that other dog that wasn't exhibiting severe, by our definition, signs of distress. Maybe based on breed, even. a beagle may more likely howl or bark when a person isn't there than say a Great Pyrenees. You get the gist of what I'm saying? So in order to adjust the brain chemistry, there are one of two things or two things we can do right off the bat, right off the bat. And there are pharmaceuticals now, I'm not gonna talk about it in detail. I'm not a veterinarian and I can't, but I can say this, it helps adjust brain chemistry so the dogs can learn. Some do take weeks to kick in, but others do not. And it's those other do not category, especially if the landlord is saying, you have two days to fix this, that your veterinarian can help you with. So I say, be proactive. I am not one for saying, I'll talk about some other products which are hugely helpful, but I'm not saying try those first. I'm saying for this issue, for separation anxiety, that's identified as separation anxiety, jump on it. Do what you need to do. The second is called the calmer canine. So uh, pharmaceuticals are, of course, chemistry. This uses physics, and it's targeted pulsed electromagnetic fields. It's the fancy way for it. T-P-E-M-F is the initial. It's been used in human medicine for a very long time. And the device called the Calmer Canine emits these signals. And what this does is it increases the production of nitrous oxide and decreases, by the way, pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines. Cytokines are a broad and loose categories to describe small proteins important in cell signaling. In English, that all means that when these dogs are panicked, their brain, or a part of the brain called the amygdala, actually swells. And this lowers that effect. So the dog doesn't have a swollen amygdala. Also, we induce the production of the kind of endorphins we want to see, uh, such as serotonin and dopamine. Now, it doesn't do this overnight, but it can, which I'll talk about. So the effects of the calmer canine on reducing signs of separation anxiety in dogs. There was a pilot study that was initially done. Here's what they found. It statistically made a huge difference, but there's more. And this is hot off the press. So 40 client-owned dogs with moderate or severe, you see they define it here. 
separation anxiety completed a placebo-controlled double-blinded study. Video showed significant reduction in negative behaviors of the group compared to the placebo group, the group with the, using the coma canine, compared to the placebo group by the sixth week. And a higher percent of success in week four that made a difference leading up to the huge success of week six. Dogs treated with the calmer canine showed a difference in reduction in separation anxiety by the six week of treatment, as I said, compared to dogs with a placebo device. So that's the way to do a study, right? So some of these dogs had a device that looked the same, but did nothing. And, and others had the calmer canine. Uh, so people actually thought this device was emitting signals and it wasn't doing anything. Actively treated dogs had a much greater, higher percent of success at all time periods compared to dogs in the placebo group. Calmer canine was shown to be safe and well tolerated, and that's really important. So I'm, I'm all for using the psychopharmaceuticals and the calmer canine. However, here's the reality. Calmer canine, and I, I want those two because they're the biggest hitters that we have. Maybe something will be created five years from now or something, but right now that's what we have. And they're good. They're really good at doing what they're supposed to do to inhibit anxiety. The calmer canine has no side effects, no adverse reactions that are known. Zero, nothing, except maybe the person forgets to use it or something. I mean, nothing, 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 nothing. Drugs can have interactions with other drugs. Drugs can have adverse responses. And there are some dogs that can't tolerate and there are pet parents that don't want. So for the pet parents that don't want psychopharmaceuticals, here is a solution. For the pet parents that are okay with pharmaceuticals, I suggest using both. Get, deal with this problem head on. Do what you can right there. And then you can always back off on the pharmaceuticals. You could titrate down, lower the amount of pharmaceutical you're using. You can lower the dosage over time, depending on the drug, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 50% of owners documented an improvement after one week of treatment using the calmer canine. That's huge. And it was actually surprising in a good way. Let me give you some case studies. Here's Elliot, a three and a half year old beagle. Howling, it's what beagles do, right? Now, this is, of course, before calmer canine. You see the Kong toys all over the room here. It's a beagle, a beagle who loves to eat. Uh, this one is right now eating part of the bed because I'm not interested in those Kong toys. I am so distressed. This is what a panic attack looks like. Not a happy beagle. So I want to jump the video ahead a little because it's really more of the same. One month later. I'm interested now in those conch toys with the treats. There aren't as many in the room to choose from, but I'll find them. And this dog is doing that. This dog is not howling, though beagles do howl. This dog isn't at the moment and seems quite content, right? So here's the data. Uh, before calmer canine, the dog hardly slept when the people left. A month later, the dog was mostly sleeping. Uh, the whining and the howling went way down. And as you saw, the dog was more interested in the treats. Here's another example. This is Cooper. Cooper's 10-year-old male mixed breed dog. Oh, there we go. Video is not playing. Come on, Cooper. We want to see the video play. So Cooper, as I said, is a male mixed breed dog. Hmm. Interesting forward a little bit. Okay, so what we see with Cooper is a lot of vigilance, which is another sign of separation anxiety. Always looking at the door, always looking out the window. I'm not quite sure why it's not playing on its own. I have to kind of help it along. Um, but Cooper is there staring at the door, like I said. Uh, and let me get before there's a lot of barking going on. All right. One month later, Cooper's just sitting there. Okay, you're leaving. I'm not happy about that. But I can deal with it. And Cooper's just like looking very beautiful, almost like a stuffed animal, you know. Uh, but Cooper's just, okay, hanging out. 
investigating. Now, you could tell by the way a dog lays down, whether that dog is stressed or not, right? This dog couldn't be more relaxed, right? I mean, that's the epitome of relaxation in dogs when a dog is laying on his side or her side. Again, one month after and for using the calmer canine, I'll let you look at the data itself. The barking particularly went from 855 barks uh, to zero as one example. All right, now practical issues of using the calmer canine. We, you, you can dose down very often on the, the pharmaceutical product we use. It can be used and should be used in conjunction with behavior modification, which is what I'll talk about next. A jumpstart to improvement in skull cases. Uh, older dogs uh, who can't take medicine can certainly take this. Now I'm gonna go back here in time and get to where I wanted to go. Behavior modification. So the most important thing I just talked about, using pharmaceutical and or calmer canine. Second most important thing is really also the most important thing. They're kind of tied for first place. And to do them in conjunction with one another is ideal. And that's behavior modification. There are lots of things you can do. First of all, encourage independence in the house. Teach that dog to lay over there on a bed, on a sofa, wherever, build the mat. That's your spot. And it's next to me. It's not on me. It's next to me. Then further and further and further away. Teach the dog to be independent and happy when you're alone. You can't expect the dog to be independent and happy when you're not home if the dog can't do it when you are. So that's the first thing to do. Calm returns and eradicating departure cues. So you know you're going to leave the house. Your dog knows before you do somehow. I don't know how they know. They do. And they begin to get anxious even before you go. So what you can do for some dogs that actually does help is stuff some little pieces of hot dog or something really good in a toy. The dog smells it. The dog knows it's up on a counter. Unless it's a great Dane that can reach the counter, then up on top of the fridge or in the fridge or somewhere the dog knows it's there and is focused on that about 10 minutes before you leave the house instead of being focused on the fact that you're leaving the house. Now that can backfire. It rarely does, but it can. It can backfire, I'm just telling you, where the dog uses that as a cue that you're about to leave and actually gets nervous when the hot dogs come out. That doesn't happen. Typically what happens is the dog focuses on that instead of the cues of you going. The other thing you can do to eradicate cues is be the best actor you can. Take a day or a weekend or several days and do everything like you're about to leave the house. Where I live in Chicago means putting on your winter coat, maybe putting on your hat and gloves and go but then come right back in, ignore the dog. And then what we're going to do is we're going to do this more often. And that's right here, they're called graduated departures. You need a camera here to see what the dog is doing when you're not there. And then add up the time inconsistently that you, you're going. So here's what I mean by inconsistent. You're gone for a minute, then you're gone for two minutes, then you're gone for three minutes, dog is fine. You can tell by the camera, dog is scarfing up food, the dog is okay. Not upset about, but when you hit the four minute mark, the dog isn't. And you have to back down the two minutes. Kind of get the idea of what I'm talking about. Then you go to six minutes, and then three minutes, and seven minutes, and five minutes, and six minutes, then 10 minutes, then three minutes. You never know, or the dog never knows either, how long you're going to be gone for. It's just totally inconsistent, totally random. And we want to set up the dog for success. We don't want to push it too hard too fast. Take a three-day weekend. And that's the ideal time that you can do this or any several days in a row that you can, because it'll take that long. And now you've got it up to say two hours, but then you've got to go to work for eight hours. So what do you do? Well, that's where a dog walker comes in. That's where doggy daycare comes in because otherwise you're going to slide right back to where you started from in the first place. So you always want to maintain the dog under that dog's individual threshold. And it may take uh, for quite a while, a dog walker or doggy daycare, if it's a good doggy daycare that the dog enjoys, something else. Maybe the dog is staying at your sister's house or something for those days until you can work up the time completely. 
And I'm gonna go back one slide, not 10 slides. Oh my gosh. Um, too many slides. There we go. That's what I wanted. Exercise is still important. Now I said exercise is not the cure in of itself for separation anxiety, but it can be helpful. Absolutely true. Dr. Ian Dunbar said a good dog is a tired dog. You can have an exhausted dog and still have separation anxiety, but can it be a part of the solution? Absolutely. Also enriching the environment. By the way, no downside to appropriately exercising any dog and also definitely enriching the environment. We need to do more of that. Now, what we also want to do is we want calm departures. And uh, when you come home, we want the dog to be rewarded only for being calm as well. So what we tend to do is say, oh no, I'm leaving the house. I hope you'll be okay. Please, please. I'm only going to the store for 20 minutes and it might be 30 minutes. I hope, oh my gosh. We don't do that with our spouses or our significant others. Why do we do this with our dogs? Stop the drama. Just leave. Stop. Show the dog that you're leaving. Don't sleep at the house. Because then the dog's going to look everywhere for you, realize you're not there and maybe panic. We don't want that either. But we don't want drama. Or drama when you come home. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. I've, I've been gone an hour. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. We don't need to do that either. That's, that actually makes matters worse. What we do want to do is wait until the dog, who is always happy to see us, because dogs always are, but dogs with separation distress seem to be over the top. So what we want to do is we want to wait until they calm down, then pet the dog or say hello. Dogs are going to go crazy again. Just same thing. Wait till the dog calms down. Dog only gets attention for being reasonably calm. Everything I just said is really confusing as far as behavior modification. I know that. Um, now, it can be written out. It can be made simpler. There's a commitment from you. It's hard. And compliance is hard when there are more than five instructions. I understand that and can be, as I said, plain confusing. So I talked about this, so I'm not going to do that again. Um, talked about that too. Now, let's say you want to throw more at the problem and or, okay, things are going well. Comer, canine, I'm in week four. It's doing what it's supposed to do. I've started pharmaceuticals, but now I've I want to wean off of them. What can I do? Well, here are some ideas. One is called calming care, and this is in no particular order. Calming Care Purina Pro Plan. It's a uh, nutritional supplement. It can be used with anything else I've talked about earlier, the Calmer Canine or pharmaceuticals. All these things I'm about to talk about can be used in conjunction with, uh, or instead of maybe pharmaceuticals at some point. Uh, it's a probiotic, it makes sense. Uh, nerves go to our tummies, right? Before a big test. And it can be same for dogs as well. So our GI system is connected to our brains. We know that's true for us. We know that's true for dogs. This can help some dogs. Again, many of these dogs also have general anxiety. So we want to lower that anxiety in general anyway. And that's a great way to do it, as are these ideas. Zilkeen, these are nutraceuticals. So they're not nutritional supplements. And they're not pharmaceuticals. Once weaned off the pharmaceuticals, this is a good substitute. They're somewhere in between. Uh, they're kind of a hybrid of a, a nutritional supplement and a pharmaceutical. Zilkeen contains hydrolyzed milk protein. It's like almost what great grandma said, you know, you're worried about something, drink a warm cup of milk, it'll calm you down. And it does help for many dogs. There are many nutraceuticals. I'm talking about uh, Zilkeen and Anxetane because these two have science behind them. There are probably 150 out there, maybe more. And these two have published peer-reviewed science behind them. Anxetane is L-theanine. It's an amino acid uh, that is naturally found in green tea that helps to lower anxiety as well. Uh, if you throw something at it, it may stick. I mean, it varies from dog to dog. Uh, but what I tell people to do when they leave the house is leave on a ceiling fan it creates white noise. Music therapy, we know helps um, many dogs. Studies have been done on that. It helps to calm dogs. It also prevents maybe you, or the dog, not you, 
with the dog from hearing some outside noises if the dog is generally anxious about outside noises, which some of these dogs are. Uh, having a radio or TV on can be helpful similarly. The ceiling fan. Okay, that's, that's not the purpose of the ceiling fan. No, the thing I get asked about most often is a CBD. So does it work, doesn't it work? Well, depending on who the veterinary professional is or more over on where you happen to live and that veterinary professional happens to live, there's limitations, silly as they may seem, on even talking about legal limitations. I'm talking about CBD. The other thing is we just don't know. So there are so many, so many thousands of CBD products out there. Um, there are only a few that we know something about in the animal health arena, uh, first of all. And those are the ones I would endorse. But secondly, for the ones we don't know, we also don't know what's in them exactly. Uh, they have traces of metals in them, for example, the ones from China that's been found to be true. Not everything from China, probably. I don't know. And that's the thing. I don't know. Nobody does know, you know. So it's like use at your own risk. Can it be helpful? Probably. Studies have been done. Uh, we know that certain kinds of seizures and osteoarthritis dogs can benefit uh, from CBD, at least the products that have been tested, which may not be the same as the products that haven't been tested. So CBD, it's still the Wild West, and we just don't know enough. These dogs, to me, wearing the calmer canine, look like little angels. I can't help but to say that. And, uh, whoa, that, how did that happen? Oh, my gosh. Um, let me see if I could make this larger. I think I can. Okay. So what I do hope is that you find me in social media. Most of all, I hope you found this talk helpful.